And I do think that the pandemic also has been a very powerful eye-opener as to how many of the everyday actions and contexts that impact our happiness that we were not aware of, not grateful for. We just took them for granted and only now realized that not having the opportunity to meet with friends, to talk with people, to have a cup of coffee with someone, to go to work, to go to the gym, all these simple everyday actions and interactions, how important they are to our well-being. This is Sachin and this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We'd love to hear from you. Today's guest is Mikael Dalian, a wonderfully brilliant, thought-provoking, and multifaceted professor in the Department of Marketing and Strategy at Stockholm School of Economics. He has a uniquely curious mind, which has led to novel findings in many areas, including happiness, marketing, habits, and consumer behavior. Michael is the author of Monster, Nextopia, Creativity Unlimited, and the recently released book, Static Kul. He is also the creator of Curious with Michael, an audible podcast. In this episode, we tackle the topic of happiness from all angles, what it is and why it's important. Michael's personal journey in search for happiness, models for achieving and measuring happiness, as well as how technology may impact the arc of our future happiness. We also discuss how our environment influences self perceived happiness. There are some real gems in this episode, especially in the second half. We love to start with knowing more about our interviewees. We'd love to learn about your childhood and how you got into academia and your journey so far. Wow, that was really starting from uh, the very beginning. Well, well my, my, my childhood was pretty lonely and pretty confusing, I would say. And I think that's why I wound up where I'm at right now. I was born in a time when we would have not been able to do what we're doing right now, talking to each other from different parts of the planet. If I were to talk to someone, I needed to be within the same room because there were no screens, there was no internet, there was no nothing, basically. And also there was no hearing on my part. I was, I thought I was cursed with really bad hearing. But years later, now I realized that it was probably a blessing. It made me into who I am right now, uh, a professor, a, a very curious person who always follows curiosity, whatever I'm curious at, wherever it leads me. I don't think I would have done that if I had heard what people told me, what teachers tried telling me, to stick to one way of thinking, not to ask too many questions, not to make too much noise. But I didn't hear that. And, and sometimes that meant they, they threw me out of the classroom. So I had to sit in my own room and think a lot, which I think it uh, helped me develop a, a rich inner life, so to speak, a, a constant dialogue with people, entities, and questions in my mind. Some might disagree with me and say that I have a different kind of, <laughs> that there's a term for that, <laughs> a psychological term, a diagnosis for that. But for me, it's, it's a, a constant dialogue with, with all the questions and ideas that pop up in my head constantly. And they never stop. They've kept me company throughout my entire childhood, 
upbringing. And once I cracked the code to stay in the classroom, I managed to get high grades. I managed to, <laughs> to trick the teachers and the school system to have me stay in school. And it allowed me to get into business school eventually. And there, before I figured out what I wanted to do in life, uh, the professors asked me, I think, my final or penultimate year if I ever thought of pursuing a PhD. And I did not, but it made me curious. So that I did and stayed. And somewhere along the line, realized that this is the perfect place for me to be with all the questions in my head and the curiosity that keeps throwing me off in all kinds of directions. So yeah, that's kind of it. Never had a, at least what my mother called, proper job. <laughs> she wished that I would have a proper job uh, and sent me to business school. I've never had a proper job. Uh, I studied, 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 wound up being a professor. And on the side, I've been blessed with the opportunity to have a full-time employment as a professor at the Stockholm School of Economics, but also to annually, at the beginning of each year, ask for a 50% leave of absence to pursue other things that I'm curious of. So I dabble a bit in writing, in public speaking, or at least before the world was shut down and there's no such thing as public gatherings anymore. Now it's just speaking alone in my room. <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> I'm back to where I started. <laughs> Studying your background, it's very clear that early on in your life, you've made a lot of meaningful contributions to the world, meaningful and diverse, to say the least. One of them certainly is within and around the area of happiness. And we'd like to spend some time with you talking about that. You seem to have gone through your own personal journey. I think everyone goes through their own personal journey as it relates to their own happiness and, of course, their place in, in this world. And maybe as a starting point, how would you define happiness and why is happiness even important? Uh, and my definition has actually become a very academic one. I'm not done with happiness. I, I, I'm far from knowing everything I want to know about happiness. So this is my working definition. My definition right now is that happiness is a scale, a scale that ranges from, from 1 to 10 or 1 to 100 or, or any range you, you prefer to use, but it's a range. It's not just the top end of the scale where we're euphoric, ecstatic, where we're everything that most of us associate with happiness and regret feeling only for very short periods. Happiness is actually a scale ranging from, from really high for short periods of time to pretty high for most of the time to rather low, unfortunately a bit too often and fortunately enough, very low, very rarely. But happiness is all points of the scale and synonyms to happen is that, that researchers often use our subjective well-being or life satisfaction. And those are terms I think we should use more in everyday language too, to realize that it's not an either or. So that's my first answer to your question, what happiness is. In my mind right now, after having studied it for lots of years, but expecting to study it for many, many years more, and the other question was, why is it important? And why is it important to me? The reason why I'm so interested in happiness is because I'm intrigued with people. I think that partly has to do with my rather isolated upbringing and my poor hearing. I didn't hear and really understand why people did what they did, what they said, what they liked and so forth. And I still don't really always understand why people behave the way they do, why they dream of the things they dream of, or certainly as a professor in business and economics, why people 
sweat for money, fight for money, cry over money. What's the end game? What is it all about? And as far as I've come right now, it has to do with the notion, the idea that whatever we do, we do because we hope and expect that it will make us feel better. For lack of a better word, it will make us happy. So that's why I'm interested in happiness. That's my way of understanding where the money goes, why we chase it personally, or in business, or in, uh, on a societal level, and also trying to figure out are there more efficient and effective ways of creating welfare, of making people feel better than chasing money, for instance. How can we use our time, our skills, our energy in the best possible way? But what's been your method in exploring happiness? You've, you've done it for a number of years. What's been your method and process for doing so? I'm terribly impatient person. I'm intrigued and a lot of other people are intrigued by the fact that I'm an academic, I'm a professional academic, I'm a professor, but I'm also really, really impatient and, and want to find out things right away. As soon as a question pops up in my mind, I just want to go straight after it. Meaning that my method is doing a lot of studies all the time. And it's never the one big end it all, find it all study, but a lot of small studies that are sometimes experiments on myself and people around me action-based experiments. I conduct experiments on my students, which is, oh, having students is a blessing for a curious person. It's like my lab rats. I can lock them up in a room and <laughs> do all kinds of experiments on them. And they do so. Fortunately, they do so willingly. <laughs> and then I, I conduct large-scale experiments online, which is also so cool. I mean, I grew up before the internet and could never imagine such a thing. And even when I started pursuing my PhD, that, that was just around the time that the internet came about, mid-90s, at least when it came into the public eye. So that was actually why they hired me, why they wanted me to pursue a PhD to look into this new thing called the internet. And is internet something that's going to catch on, basically? So I conducted what was then considered big data, huge, large-scale studies. I think my PhD dissertation comprised studies of 16,000 people, which at that time, around the millennium, was like unfathomable. Really? That many people? And I spent five years surveying all these people and actually looking into their behaviors and matching and everything. And nowadays, when I'm curious about something, I can survey 16,000 people tonight and have the answers done and the numbers crunched tomorrow. And that I do too. That's my long and winding answer to the question, uh, what method do I use? Well, I use all kinds of methods, surveys, I observe behaviors, I conduct experiments, small and large scale. When it comes to humans and happiness, could we go a bit deeper into describing the relationship which humans have had with happiness and maybe also take a historic lens to it? Has the notion of happiness changed over the period of human history? And if it has, how has it changed? Yeah, the, the study of happiness is surprisingly young. The first published study, the first published article came in 1917, I believe, just over 100 years ago, from a American psychiatrist and first-generation, so to speak, neuroscientist. 
called Abraham Meyerson, and he published a article in a journal with the lovely title, A Journal of Abnormal Psychology. I love that. And the title of his article was A Program for Mental Hygiene. So that's basically, at least to academia, where it all started. Happiness is something abnormal that we need to understand better for the sake of mental hygiene basically being about figuring out why people are not content with the jobs they have and might digress from their marital paths and stuff like that. Basically, discrepancies, digressions from the expected and preferred normal path of just being content and just being civil. Basically, a couple of years later, after Abraham Meyerson uh, Sigmund Freud published his article called something along the lines of On Society and Its Discontents, basically saying that people are unhappy because society forces us to be civil, and being civil and being happy is impossible because happiness is about following all our primitive drives and urges, and so to speak. That's kind of where it started in research, but you can go even further back and look into the linguistic aspect of it, where if you look into the word happiness, it actually stems from hap, which is Old Norse, Old English for chance, basically. The same thing in, in Swedish, it's called lycka, which comes from the German glück, which also means chance or luck. That's kind of, in terms of talking about happiness when it comes into language, where it started sometime in medieval times, saying that you can never count on being happy. You can hope for it, and if you're really lucky, just by pure chance, you might stumble on happiness once every while. And then later on come the 1900s. It was a matter of actually trying to, to curb your strive for happiness because it's not really fruitful. And I'd say that that's been the view on happiness, being something that you might stumble on and should not hope for more than stumbling on occasionally in order for your life to be functional, in order for society to be functional. And that was the view and way. I mean, basically, I call that being kind of the way I was raised too in the late 1900s. And when I started pursuing my PhD around the turn of the millennium, I'd say, is when that really started shifting. That's when I wrote a book called Nextopia, which was my way of trying to put a term to the observation that people seemingly had started to focus more and more not on what they have or had and not what they do or had done, but what they could, would, and dreamt of having and doing next. Something that must be even better. A increasing, accelerating chase for something more, something better. That's really when I started looking into happiness, to try to reconcile that whole thing of people not being content anymore, but chasing faster and faster forward is something that well, no one really knows what it is. If you were to map this to one's life and as one grows in life, what have been your experiences when it comes to happiness? Happiness related to the life cycle is pretty much a U-shape. For some people, steeper. For some people, flatter. But it's pretty universal that people start out pretty happy. Most people have a fairly happy childhood and beginning of life with happy everyday experiences and a greater focus on everyday experiences and learning and discoveries. And then after a while, starting basically in adolescence 
and from there it's all downhill. We become a little less happy when we become more and more occupied with routines, not discovering new stuff, but actually uh, routinely going to school, going to work, doing all the things we perceive that we have to and need to do, planning and building a career, planning and building a family, being really busy with doing everything we need to do because we feel that we need to do it for our sake or for someone else's sake. And then after having done that and basically reaching rock bottom in middle age, questioning everything in life, why am I doing this? Hopefully coming to terms with a lot of those questions and then picking up again, going up, happiness and <laughs> Like it or not, depending on how you look at it, uh, basically from middle age, it goes up, up, up until you die. And basically you peak just before you die, on average. So is it fair to say that the world tethers you into expectations and as a human, you follow those expectations uh, based on the society you may be living in that creates this curve, if you will. Very much so. Very much so. I love, are you familiar with the experiment where they put bright yellow colored t-shirts on students with Barry Manilow, the, the, the old Muzak singer, not very cool singer from the 70s and 80s, his face on the t-shirts of college students. So they put brightly yellowed Barry Manilow t-shirts on college students and had them wait before they entered the classroom. So the rest of the class had entered the classroom and sat down. And then after everyone was seated, the researchers sadistically opened the door and let this student with a brightly yellow t-shirt in. And then they asked the student, how did this feel? And the student was so stressed out, reporting that everybody was looking at them. Everybody was whispering about them. Everybody was shaking their heads because they came in with this strange, not very cool t-shirt. And then the researchers asked the rest of the class, so did you notice anything in particular about the student who was late? Their appearance? And some did, but I think... I don't remember the exact numbers, but a huge majority of the students did not take much notice of that late student and the yellow t-shirt. And that's one example of what is often called the spotlight effect, that we tend to feel like we have a bright spotlight directed at us, focusing everyone's attention at us so that everyone is observing, monitoring, and scrutinizing my every action and move and have ideas about what I do and what I should and should not do that I need to comply with. And that I've also conducted experiments with my students. I've asked my students to demustify their lives, to, to take away the musts, take away the things they feel that they must do because others have expectations of them because they have careers and family and everything and I must do this for the sake of my career, for the sake of my organization, for the sake of my family and everything. So I ask them to, to remove one thing every day that they feel that they must do for the sake of others but that they don't really want to do and because of that, feel a little less happy. And, and most of the students felt really stressed. Oh, this is going to go terribly. I might lose my job. I might lose my family or, or something like that. So I told them that, okay, if anyone asks, tell them that your professor, that Mikael Lalian, forced me to do this. So I, I promise that I will solve any issues that might arise. So, so please do this. Just try it out. 
And then I ask them to keep diaries, to, to do this every day, keep a diary and, and report on uh, what must, what thing they skipped doing that they felt that they needed to, that they uh, were expected to do, and also report how it made them feel and what happened. And after around three weeks or so, almost all the students had sent their diaries to me and I could see that they had managed to demystify their lives. They had all survived. Nobody had lost their jobs or their families. They felt so much better just by removing one small action and relieving some time to do something they would like to do instead and feel that they had some control over their lives. Made a real impact every day that accumulated. Made them feel much better. And then there were some students that had not even sent back their diary, so I was a bit worried that they had died or lost their jobs or something terrible had happened. So I reached out to find out what happened, and they told me, well, we just realized that, well, we didn't have to. That was a must that we just <laughs> skipped sending the diaries back. That is pretty fascinating. One other line of questioning around this, what has been your personal journey with happiness, given that you've studied it? How have you applied it in your life? Oh, in so many, in so many different ways. People sometimes ask me about the books I write. Are they uh, some kind of dissertation? Are they textbooks or are they self-help books? And I've realized that they are self-help books. They are books that I write to help myself. When I write them, I write them to, to really come to terms with what I've learned during all my research and how it can be summarized easily enough to be put to use, mostly by myself. So I use all kinds of things I've realized in my happiness research, one of them being this whole thing of not doing things because I feel that I must do them, but because I want to do them. So that means that I try to either remove things from my calendar that I feel that I must do and stress over, or I try to find a way of feeling that I want to do them try to take a stance towards those things that make me curious about doing them or find some kind of fun, cheeky aspect that makes me do it and have fun while doing it. So that's one aspect. Another aspect, something I learned in my happiness research is that not all of the happiness that I or anyone feels is even possible to influence that around half, a little less than 50% of my baseline happiness is genetically disposed. It's something that I was born with. We're all born with different baselines of happiness. And, and rather than being frustrated by the fact that my baseline is not very high, which is one reason why I started looking into happiness, because I felt that I need to be better at it. And I've been so frustrated over the years by the fact that no matter how much I learn about happiness, it's like that movie Groundhog Day. Every morning I wake up once again to a gloom February Monday in the American Midwest and it's snowing. I'm not very happy like Bill Murray in that old movie. And rather than being frustrated by that fact, I'm kind of relieved. I embrace that fact that I have my own individual baseline. I don't need to fret about it, but focus on the other 50% that I can do something about because happiness is a scale. It's not about regretting and ruminating over the fact that I'm not a perfect 10. But if I start out at a 4 out of 10, I still have a lot of room up to 10 or just bumping on myself up to a 5 or 6. Is still great, still makes me feel a lot better. And that's something to celebrate. 
And that I can do every day. So in, in Swedish, there's this notion of att vara sin egen lyckas med. Basically, you're the creator of your own happiness. You're saying you're debunking that, <laughs> essentially. So your notion is that about half of happiness is pure chance or outside of your control because of biological factors. Exactly. And, and of course, we need to highlight that an important assumption here. I, I think, at least for myself, I'm thinking about a human being operating in the Western world or, or quote unquote, a developed country, a notion I don't necessarily agree with. But how about for somebody in a resource poor environment who might be fighting to put food on the table every day? I think there are examples of human beings being very happy, albeit in a very resource constrained environment. How do you think about that? Yeah, and that's that's fascinating. And that I think is why it's so important to think of economics in terms not only of money, but in terms of welfare according to a broader definition. Because if welfare and the well-being of peoples in a nation was solely dependent on economics in terms of money, then we should be so much happier in the Western world than people in, in other parts of the world. And according to so many studies, because this has been subject to a lot of studies over the years, that's not the case. We're not much happier in our part of the world than people in other parts of the world. And people in other parts of the world are not that much unhappier than we are. We are, in fact, a bit, a bit happier. We are, that's a fact, but it's not a lot. And one reason, actually, why we are a bit happier in our part of the world is that by way of, for instance, which we've talked about, uh, the internet, the interconnectedness, the awareness of the world having grown throughout the years, people in other parts of the world have become more aware of how good we are off, how well we are off in the Western world, financially, and a lot of other aspects. Because happiness is very sensitive to comparisons. So previously, people compared themselves to others in their very immediate community, basically being villages or small cities. And in those small communities, people tend to be pretty similar when it comes to living standards and so forth. And that's why there weren't very great differences between different parts of the world, because we couldn't compare between ourselves. But now that poorer nations and people in poorer nations can compare themselves and change their levels of aspirations, they have become a bit unhappier. That's a paradox. So if, if you would isolate or, or think about a root cause, the relative aspect of happiness and how we tend to compare ourselves to others, to your mind, that has a lot of explanatory power. Indeed, very much so. We are social beings, extremely social. Most of the time, we don't do it knowingly, but still most of the time we do things, perceive things with some kind of relation to others, how others might react, what others do, how I compare, and so forth. Others impact virtually everything we do. There are even fascinating experiments like ask people, which would you prefer to have a 20K salary while others receive a 10K salary or to have a 40K salary while others receive an 80K salary? When facing that choice, a majority of people opt for a 20K salary meaning they prefer having a half as big salary because it's twice as big 
as others' salaries. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, to an economist, that's very rational to opt for a lower salary, to opt for a 50% salary. That would make me worse off in absolute terms. But we don't think in absolute terms. We think in relative social terms and feel that that, in economic terms, half salary is actually, in relative terms, a double salary in comparison to others. And that's what people prefer. How, how do you think this notion of happiness interacts with the idea of consciousness? If you would isolate dim that dimension, all else equal, a human being who's a lot more conscious, do you think that person is by necessity happier? No, definitely not by necessity. And of course, kind of depends on how one defines that term. I mean, awareness obviously has a negative impact because greater awareness enables more comparison and the more comparison you can make, the greater likelihood of a, a non-favorable comparison coming into the mix. And there are studies showing that education and IQ correlates negatively with happiness because the more aware we become of the world, of the opportunities out there, and with those opportunities comes the miss opportunities, comes the lack of control, the lack of certainty and everything. And that in previous studies turns out makes us overall a bit less satisfied with life. But then if you think of, of it in other terms that is starting to gain popularity, uh, like flourishing, are you familiar with the term flourishing? Sure. Personal growth, becoming one's best self and realizing that I am not one, but I'm part of a potential oneness, mm -hmm. so to speak. That's something that has just recently come into the eye of researchers. And we don't have the full picture there, but I just now started looking into meaning in life, a kind of other side, flip side of the coin of happiness, as we know it, so to speak. Yeah, it's kind of what Freud was into as well, a kind of contentedness of being fine, kind of being fine with not necessarily being happy, that there's a greater good that doesn't require me being happy, or maybe even requires me making sacrifice of my own personal happiness for the sake of others, for the sake of a greater good. It creates a greater sense of meaning in life. That's something that very recently myself and a lot of researchers starting looking into, which I think is fascinating and which definitely I think needs more attention in light of our greater interconnectedness, greater awareness, greater conscience and everything. Stepping back, what have you learned as it relates to a model or models for achieving happiness based on your research, your own personal experience? If you would synthesize and distill your learnings around any type of model or models for achieving happiness, what would that be? Think of happiness as a scale. That's number one. And the purpose of that is to rid yourself of what I call happy chondria. The fact that we may, we may make ourselves less happy because we think of happiness as the end point of the scale and anything less than the end point, we therefore believe is wrong and some kind of unhappiness. Thinking of happiness as a scale, where happiness exists on all points of the scale, minimizes the risk of 
not feeling or allowing yourself to feel happiness below the end point and thinking that you are actually unhappy when you're not. And also not to strive for happiness at that end point because striving for happiness, which is also a pretty new thing, which I think pretty much came with the millennium, the awareness of all the opportunities out there with the abundance of opportunities for consumption, for career choices, for education choices, all these choices, basically. If you uh, have happiness as the benchmark, as like the criterion whenever you choose a partner, a soft drink or whatever, you never really enjoy anything. It's a really, really tough standard to measure anything by. We have spoken about happiness coming from within oneself, happiness being impacted or affected by one's ideas of how the world expects someone to follow certain guidelines, certain criteria, a path as well. How does happiness relate to the world which we are currently living in? We have very limited interactions. There is a lot of uncertainty. There is, of course, information overload. What's happened with the pandemic and how the world has been overturned in so many ways, I think that's a pretty powerful illustration of the fact that happiness is and needs to be perceived as a scale. Because I think hardly anyone is at the top end of the scale right now. And the only way to reconcile that and to to feel a bit better is to not regret being not being on the top end of the scale, but just coming to terms with the fact that we're all somewhere far lower on the scale right now. Just coming to terms with that and do what we can from that starting point allowing ourselves and celebrating any small step up on the scale. If we're on a two right now, allow ourselves to try to be open to bump up to a three or a four, because any step up makes us a bit happier. And with that comes a host of important effects on our well-being, makes us a bit more optimistic and open to try out new paths in our careers, in our social lives, in our lives, everything. It gives us a bit more energy and optimism to do something rather than feeling complete helplessness in the face of everything and the lack of control we have right now. And also focusing on the small things, the immediate things that we can impact right now. I mean, a crazy example, the the hoarding of TP. Do you remember everyone hoarding toilet paper? Yeah, totally. It's a crazy example how we need to feel some kind of control over our lives. And when the pandemic started and it felt like we lost all sense of control, well, that was one very tangible way of gaining some kind of control. I mean, (laughs) I think it's pretty funny that, I mean, if you go back to Freud and everything, in psychology, it's called the anal phase, right? (laughs) Literally, (laughs) where you feel a compulsive sense of control. (laughs) So the first thing we rushed off to (laughs) was toilet paper. So that's a crazy illustration. But regaining some kind of control over your own happiness. One way of doing that is looking into immediate small actions, not planning for long-term happiness for the rest of the year, for the rest of the month, but right here, right now, today. What can I do to feel just a little happier today? 
And I do think that the pandemic also has been a very powerful eye opener as to how many of the everyday actions and contexts that impact our happiness that we were not aware of, not grateful for. We just took them for granted and only now realized that not having the opportunity to meet with friends, to talk with people, to have a cup of coffee with someone, to go to work, to go to the gym, all these simple everyday actions and interactions. We just now realize how important they are to our well-being. And I think we need to use that realization to something good, to find other new ways of interacting via screens, for instance. I mean, it was just, just a couple of months ago. I mean, in the beginning of this year, most of the talk was still about how bad screens are for our well-being. And uh, at my school, the Stockholm School of Economics, uh, the first year students, they had a course called Global Challenges, where one of the global challenges they were to work with was too much screen time. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything changed. And now we realize that screens can be crucial and really great for our well being, as means, as maybe the only means of interacting with friends, relatives, and so forth, of having virtual digital coffees and everything. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is uh, going to the gym, going for a run, exercising. I think that's fascinating to see. If you look into sales, I think sales of kettlebells increased by 600% during the spring. Yoga mats, similar numbers rubber bands, and so forth. Only now, when not being able to, what many previously thought was something we had to do. Oh, I have to go to the gym. I have to go for a run. Only now, when we can't do it the same way, we realize that, well, we actually need to, to feel good, to feel better. We like to hone in on this idea of, of measurement, so measuring happiness. You've talked about happiness as a scale. Maybe we go into further granularity. Is there any way we can improve the measurement of happiness as it's conducted perhaps on a societal scale, on a personal level as well? Of course. There is still so much to be done. I mean, the science of happiness is only a century old, which is nothing when it comes to science. So it's still an infant. I think the first aspect is actually, as you say, increasing the granularity, increasing the width of the scale is one thing, because happiness is about small, small improvements that we can all do individually and together. And even the smallest improvements make together a huge difference over time and between us when it comes to overall quality of life and well-being and welfare. So that's one thing to maybe have even a greater number of steps on the scale. But another aspect of that is also something I've started looking more into recently, and it's the whole notion of numbers. Numbers have rapidly crept into our lives, into all different domains of our lives, mostly because of screens, because we have our smartphones and everything. So Everything we do is basically mediated by screens and renders some kind of number. The number of steps I have taken literally when walking to wherever I walk, the number of seconds I have spent talking to you, the number of likes I get when I post something, you know, 
all these numbers creeping into our lives. The thing is that numbers, just like money, we believe are objective and concrete and directly comparable. Like if I have $10 and you have $5, then I have twice the amount you have and twice as well off. That's what we think. Whereas that's obviously not the case. It's how you actually use the money. I mean, money is basically just numbers which would enable you to do things, but we forget that and just look at the numbers. And now numbers creep into all the actions we engage in and also tell us that I took twice as many steps than I should be twice as well off and twice as happy without thinking about, okay, why did I take these many steps? How did I take these steps? How did it make me feel? And so forth. So there's actually research showing that if people are provided with pedometers and step counters, they tend to take more steps. They tend to walk more while enjoying the walk less. So they walk more, take longer walks, and simultaneously enjoy them less because they forget about why they walk, what happens when they walk and everything, and just focus on the numbers. And that's a very long and winding road to get back to your question about the gauging and measurement of happiness. I feel that there's a great risk of the same thing happening with happiness as well. As we become more aware of happiness and measure it more, if we use numbers, there's a risk that we become greedy, like with money, and forget all about how we actually feel wherever we are, and just look into, okay, so today I'm a five on the scale, and that's one step less than the six I was yesterday. And so I can't really appreciate the five on the scale. It tends to become a relative thing once again. So that's something that's pretty new that we look into. Having the scale and the granularity, but removing the numbers, that's something that we need to do. And that's the work that has just only begun. So I don't have a really good answer to. Love that counterintuitive insight, which is, I guess, somewhat controversial in today's world. Stop measuring. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I have a favorite example of that, and that was a friend of mine who started using a meditation app, which also counted the number of meditation sessions and the number of meditation minutes. We discussed that, and she wound up complaining about she was stressed that she had not meditated enough many minutes the previous week that she had to make up for it this week. So her meditation app made her more stressed rather than less stressed. It made her meditate more, but also be more stressed because she did not meditate enough more. <laughs> Well, this is a very good segue into the next question. How is technology shaping happiness? It is. I mean, I mentioned the whole mediation aspect that more and more of our experiences and lives are mediated by technology. So in that sense, technology shapes happiness. And that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a bad thing. I think of technology and screams in the same way as I think of money. It's how you use it. Money can be put to bad use and unfortunately is sometimes, but money can also be put to good use. And the same thing goes for technology. Technology is a fantastic enabler that would in fact enable us to have a greater number of interactions and relationships with other people, which is kind of like the most fundamental and potent driver of happiness. 
and well-being if we put it to that use instead of stressing out over comparing posts of Instagram with strangers that we don't really feel connected with but only compared with. So I think technology is an important part of our lives and hence an important part of our potential happiness, but we really, really need to be mindful of how we use it. And it can be used really, really effectively. And of course, the other aspect when it comes to comparison is cultivation, like with any media. It's what mass media scientists started talking about with cable TV and VHS and everything uh, with when they started talking about movie violence and everything, that our worldview is cultivated by the things we are exposed to. And the more we're exposed to the world via media, through the news, through movies, everything, we shape our views of the world, of our place in the world. And of course, with technology and social media, we're exposed more than ever to different places, peoples, and everything that cultivates our worldview. And that's important to be mindful of. To what extent is it your opinion that stakeholders, especially within the media sphere, who of course are well aware of these dynamics, they understand that number of likes, for example, on Instagram posts actually affects someone because it's the stimuli. To, to what extent do these stakeholders, not mentioning any names, do they have a responsibility or potentially even a moral responsibility in creating sort of guardrails around this? That's a super interesting question. And I don't have a very good answer to that because this whole situation and this whole dilemma is still so new that I think that we need to think in many different directions with many potential answers. So I, right now where I'm at, I think is maybe a, a pretty provocative position. I'm thinking that numbers, as we've been talking about, and when it comes to these platforms, it's a numbers game with eyeballs, with clicks, with hearts and thumbs, likes and everything. Numbers are pretty much the same thing. It's the new equivalent of money. It's, it's a currency. And if we think of it from that perspective, we know that not anyone is allowed to issue currency and to handle currency. There are a lot of laws and legislations. There are licenses. We have central banks and banks and everything. Yeah, incidentally, I know that Facebook has applied for, and I think also has been granted some kind of bank license in Ireland, for instance. So I do think that it needs to be regulated. I do think we need to think of social media, media platforms, as entities, as agents of economies equivalent to financial agents, equivalent to banks and money agents. Distinctively, what are your thoughts on the future of happiness? My thoughts on the future of happiness, I do think that we will be and we need to be more aware of happiness as a high frequency, low intensity thing, not striving for, not gauging happiness in terms of intensity, in terms of top of the scale but in terms of small increments that can be achieved and gauged every day, helping people to realize and to help each other 
achieve that every day and accumulate together and over time. And also that comes together with the notion of happiness becoming less an individual thing and more a collective thing. So realizing that we're more interconnected than ever, and that won't change. We won't be less interconnected. We won't be less aware of each other. We won't be less reliant on each other. Quite the opposite. And with that comes the realization and need to do something good with that, to not just go into a frenzy with more and more comparisons and more and more broadcasting of our achievements to perceived audience, but more and more connectedness, community, mutual contexts, and creating stuff together. Happiness becoming more and more collective. And that's also something that I've just started working on, that I will be working a lot on in the future, connecting happiness and welfare. I mean, if it's one thing that we become extremely aware of right now, it's the fact that welfare and economic in money terms doesn't really work anymore. We can't rely on economic growth, GDP, employment in the same terms. Welfare needs to be something else and something more. We need to enable and increase quality of life by other means than mm-hmm. money and traditional economics. What motivates you? Oh, that's curiosity. Definitely. All the way. I'm a incurably, it seems, curious person. That's what gets me out of bed every morning. How do you allocate your time? By the minute. Not exactly by the minute, but it's helped me a lot not to think of the day in terms of hours, which is a very finite number of 24. But if I think of it in minutes, I've upped it to 1,400, which allows me to do more, not for longer time, but I can do more things for shorter time intervals that are good enough, I think. Beautiful. Which non-consensus views do you hold near and dear? Well, we've been into that. I think the primary one is that you don't have to do anything. You always have a choice. It's a matter of definition and priority. What's the biggest trade-off in your professional existence? I refuse to answer that question (laughs) on the basis of my not believing in trade-offs. I really, I really don't believe in trade-offs. I believe in doing things pretty good, not doing things perfectly, not having to choose to do one thing because uh, otherwise I can't do it perfectly or good enough. I believe in doing everything I want to do, and I think they cross-pollinate and synthesize and and work for a better result at a whole, as long as each and every one thing is pretty good. What are you currently reading? I'm the last chapter of Dan Epstein's Range which I can definitely recommend. The fundamental thesis is basically, it pretty well ties into my, my previous answer of not trading off, of not focusing too much, of not narrowing down too much your expertise and what to do. But range is actually, and in itself, that's kind of his fundamental thesis, which I definitely enjoy. That I read in parallel with a crime novel, a Danish crime novel by, I don't remember the name, Soren something. The Chestnut Man is the title of the novel, which is a suspense thing. I can recommend that one too. Who are your favorite writers or podcasters or pundits? Writers, I really enjoy 
Bill Bryson. Bill Bryson has tackled subjects. The first thing I read by him was a book about the universe. I don't remember the exact title, but it's something along the lines of a, a short summary of the world and everything in the universe, which I loved. It ties everything together from quantum mechanics to, to how fish are constructed, basically. And his uh, last book, I think, is about the human body and everything we don't know about the human body still, which is a lot. So I can recommend Bill Bryson and Greta Thunberg. There's so much. She stirs so much. Hope, aggression, polarization gets people going from all ends of all spectra, which I think is a great thing. What projects are you currently working on? Uh, welfare. I'm looking into uh, new ways of defining, measuring, and planning for welfare. I'm working on the numberfication of our lives and society, how numbers are the new money, and how that impacts us in, in different ways. And also I'm working on the flip side of happiness, which we talked a bit about the notion of meaning in life, how how to find different kinds of meaning in life. So I think those are the major areas right now. How can listeners find out more about your work? Well, obviously, uh, this podcast is the greatest of all starting points, I'd say. I have one season on Audible of my own podcast called Curious with Mikael Dalian, where I'm curious at all kinds of different topics. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.